A listener note, this story contains adult content and language. Oh, today I'm not well, still not well. Dr. Christopher Dench performed surgery on 38 patients. 33 suffered serious injury. He still has numbness in his hand and in his arm. He drops stuff all the time, and that still happens to this day. 20 still live with some form of physical pain or paralysis. I have done everything I can. I stretch. I stay as active as possible. I try to eat right. I try to take vitamins. I do everything I can to minimize the progression of the disease, of what's going on. Only three had no complications. It was just really hard seeing him where he wasn't able to move or to to get around or to function as he normally would. And two died. I tried to speak with many of those who survived. Some of them did not want to be interviewed. They said they were working to move on or that they'd said all they have to say about Dunch. Those that did talk to me had one thing in common. Their lives will never be the same. It is very difficult for me to walk from one end of my house and up to the bedroom, up to the kitchen, and I can stand up maybe uh, two hours uh, on a good day. From the time they get up to the time they go to bed, they live with the consequences of putting their trust in Christopher Dunch. But for some of them, the hardest thing to comprehend isn't what happened. I know I have the pain. I know that it affects my family, but my thing is how did the system that's supposed to be in place allow this to happen, especially for it to affect so many people. That's been my driving question too, which leads to another. If or when other doctor deaths come along, will there be anything in place to stop them? From Wondery, I'm Laura Beal, and this is Dr. Death. This is episode six, Closure. Christopher Dunch was booked into the Dallas County Jail on July 21st, 2015, charged with injury to an elderly person and aggravated assault. Hello. Gosh, I've never tried so hard to get hold of you. Three days later, on July 24th, he called his father. Oh, I'm down. You called the phone. I'm downstairs with mom I'm, and... What, what, okay. I'm, I'm I, calling what, both lines back over and over again. Oh, I'm sorry, because I left myself... The judge has set his bond at $600,000. $100,000 more than the starting point for capital murder. Dunch planned to ask the judge to reduce the amount so he could get out before his trial. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm on pins and needles right now, just waiting to hear about the bond. Long story short, what's getting me through this week is talking to you, knowing I'm going to see my, my son in right. books. I need to use a little bit of money to help Wendy. He's talking about Wendy Young, the mother of Dunch's two kids. Of course. She, could, she couldn't work. And doesn't have, and she lives pretty far up north, and she doesn't have the ability to put enough gas and get take care of the boys and get down here tomorrow morning and, and Sunday morning. Okay. And that's really, really important to me, Dad. I know. Okay. Right now, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. I'm like literally just staring at the, the ceiling, uh, you know, and just keeping my mind in one place right now is real hard. Okay. Okay. All right, buddy. Dad. I, pre- All I right. really appreciate. It. I love you very much. Even before Christopher Dunch ended up in jail, his patients and their families had been searching for justice. Many of them had sought relief in the civil system. But despite what had happened to them, despite it being so clearly the fault of their surgeon, most of Dunch's victims had had trouble even finding lawyers. I could not find an attorney to save my life that would take the case. Come to find out, state of Texas, there are caps on malpractice and it is not worth an attorney's time and energy to take on a malpractice case in the state of texas it's so hard to do and a lot of lawyers won't even pursue it 
because you have to prove malice. You, you have to prove that this guy woke up and intended to go hurt you. There's no way we can win this case. It was, there was like, no, mm -mm, we, we can't win this case. That was Barry Morgoloff, Jeff Glidewell, and Philip Mayfield. The malpractice lawyer Kay Van Way ended up taking 14 of the cases herself, including Mayfield and Glidewell. Victims came to her after seeing her in the news. Doctors did too. There were really highly regarded physicians in the community reaching across the aisle to lawyers like me saying, please help us. We can't get this guy stopped. Can you help us? So I just felt like after, you know, 30 years or so in the arena, if I didn't step up to help, they may not have gotten the help that they needed. You see, the Texas Medical Board is the main defender of patient safety in the state of Texas. There should be something else, say, the ability to sue a doctor who's done wrong. But that's been severely restricted, thanks in no small part to some changes in Texas law. Prior to passing significant reforms in 2003, Texas was facing a bona fide crisis. That's former Texas Governor Rick Perry. Employers and doctors were easy targets for plaintiffs filing one frivolous lawsuit after another, playing the odds and hoping for a jackpot jury. The net result was a skittish business community and skyrocketing insurance rates for doctors. Those significant reforms Perry is talking about included a $250,000 cap on damages known as pain and suffering. From then on, no matter how bad the damage was, that was the maximum anyone could receive for anything other than economic loss or medical bills. At the time, state lawmakers pointed out that these reforms would lead physicians to flock to Texas safe from the fear of nuisance lawsuits. They said healthcare costs would fall and insurance premiums would become more affordable because there would no longer be a need to practice defensive medicine. Today, more than 30 states have similar laws. To find out if we, the citizens of Texas, have reaped the promised benefits, I asked Charles Silver of the University of Texas at Austin, a law professor who has studied the effects of these reforms. As we talked, he pulled up a graph showing the number of doctors in Texas per 100,000 people. The figure you're looking at has a vertical red line at 2003. That's when tort reform was enacted. If the new cap on damages worked, if doctors had flocked to Texas after the reforms, that line should have shot up after 2003. It doesn't. Health insurance costs haven't gone down either in Texas. About one in six Texans have absolutely no insurance. Currently, that's the highest rate of uninsured in the country. What has gone down? Insurance premiums for doctors. That was the only intended effect of the statute, in my opinion. And that is exactly what happened. Uh, you, you free people from liability, Insurers make money because they don't have to pay out on claims and insurance rates fall because in the future, claims cost less. Today, even as the state's population has risen, the number of annual settlements has dropped. The year legal changes were enacted, Texas had around 1,300 malpractice payouts reported to the National Practitioner Data Bank. In 2017, only about 600 malpractice cases made it across the finish line. Because the damage caps are on pain and suffering, but not economic loss or medical costs, those with the least earning power are the most vulnerable in our state. Babies, children, people in nursing homes, parents who stay home with the kids, and people like Barry Morgoloff, who can't prove that even a debilitating injury makes it impossible to work. Morgoloff finally found a lawyer, Mike Lyons, to represent him. Lyons says those caps mean that attorneys just won't take certain kinds of cases. And what I see day to day is people calling me saying, they killed my child. They killed my child in the ER. 
And now what do we do? Well, what you do is you pray that you get pregnant again and have another baby because no lawyer is going to take that case. That child didn't have a job, has no economic loss. Your physical pain and suffering is capped at 250000 Barry Morgoloff had asked several lawyers to take his case, and each time he was told no. So when he met Mike Lyons, he didn't have much hope. I remember going in and talking to Mike and him telling me that our chances of any type of recovery was slim, but he would take the case, and we were extremely grateful. The financial aspect of it, I understood. There's probably not going to be any money there, and, and there was very little. But to get this guy off the street so nobody else got hurt again was important. The public needed to know that there was a monster out there. You know, frankly, the reason that this resulted the way that it did is because of some very, very courageous doctors that stepped in and did something. And had that not happened, he may still be practicing. On August 2nd, 2015, with his bond hearing coming up, Christopher Dunch called his father again from jail. He says if he can just get out of jail before trial... I'm going to talk to my attorneys again tomorrow about what options there are for me to get out of here and work on this on the outside. Because I'm just thinking about how much is at stake and what's going on. And I'm going to tell you, no matter what ends up happening here... There's a lot of very important things going on that I can't handle from in here that could be you know, lost if I don't do something from the outside of here. He's concerned that he won't be able to defend himself legally from inside jail. I can't even use my computer. I can't, I can't give him documents. I can't I have to talk to him on, you know, in a, through a glass window the whole time up to my trial. Which is, I mean, if that's, to me, that's almost insanity. You know, that's, that's like asking to, to, to make sure you lose the case. And despite everything, Dunch hasn't given up on one day returning to surgery. That's the other thing about for me is that, you know, I mean, one of the reasons why I've been able to survive all this is, is and was about, I mean, I was about to get fight for my medical aid. Yeah. Really. Um, it's because I've been able to, at least I've been able to work on it myself and, and, and have a very, you know, strong role and everything. And now here, I think I, I can do nothing but sit. I know. And, and stare at the wall, and you know, why other people are, are handling all my, my entire life and my future. Dunch tells his father how supportive Wendy Young has been. He's really coming through for me and, and been on my side, and he, you know, defended me every chance he could get. And how much it means to him to see his sons. Yeah, I got to see my guy today. Oh, great. But even those visits are bittersweet. I know. I know. I know. I know. For all the talk about beating his case and getting his license back, Dunch feels isolated and alone. Anyway. Yeah, I'm very sorry, but very sorry. You know I am. Um, but anyway, I'm kind of. I don't have, you know, I, all I got is you and her right now. I know it. You know, I mean, I've got other people, but I don't, I don't want to have anybody, but really. Well, you've got your family, not your side. No, but even my family, Dad, I don't have anybody but you. <laughs> Bond hearing, prosecutors presented Dunch's last bank statement. His former accountant had loaned him more than $13,000. He blew through it all in a month, including several cash withdrawals, a $626 shopping trip to Walmart, and three charges in one day to a local pub that totaled $123. His attorneys asked for the bond amount to be lowered. They argued he didn't pose a risk to the public. The prosecution played those recorded calls he'd made from jail, and they asked his father if he was trying to get his license back. He responded, I guess that's probably true. Dunch didn't make bond. By this time, 
Dunch's story and his face were everywhere. A few months before Dunch's trial, D Magazine, the city's monthly glossy, published a cover story. The title was Dr. Death. The nickname stuck. Christopher Dunch's trial began on February 2nd, 2017. He seemed to be pretty confident even when he was in jail that he didn't do anything wrong. He had a team of court-appointed defense attorneys, among them Richard Franklin. And I always thought when I looked at him, even when he was in his jail clothes, he exuded a confidence, and I could certainly understand why patients would trust him. Mary Eford's surgery was the one on trial. Remember, she was a senior citizen. Michelle Shugart and the prosecution team had decided to build their case around elder abuse. If they got a conviction, Dunch could be facing life in prison. But prosecutors talked about his other cases, too. If they could show that Mary Eford, far from being Dunch's first botched surgery, was part of a larger pattern. From the start of the trial all the way through the closing arguments, they painted a portrait of a surgeon who should have known that he needed to stop operating. Really, it comes down to the sheer number of patients that he was hurting in a very short amount of time. The massive damage that he was doing to them uh, was beyond what any normal doctor would encounter in their entire careers. And he did this in a matter of two years. He certainly knowingly did these actions. He knew that he was hurting patient after patient. He had been told by other doctors, by the medical board, by hospitals kid kicking him out, um, that there were problems, and he just kept going. He didn't care. He wasn't going to stop. So by the time he took Mary Eford into the operating room, even if he didn't intend to hurt her, he had to know that he would. Mary Eford, who now has to use a wheelchair, took the stand to recount her own experience. Other patients testified, too. His defense attorneys didn't think that was fair and objected every time prosecutors talked about a case that wasn't Mary Eford. Here's the lead defense attorney, Robbie McClung. So we argued it's going to be too much outside evidence. It's going to overwhelm the jury, and it's going to be overly emotional. Over eight days of testimony, each patient who took the stand told his or her own story in excruciating detail. The widowers of Kelly Martin and Floella Brown both testified, struggling through their grief. Some patients were telling their stories publicly for the first time. You had people in walkers, you had people on crutches, you had people that could barely move. You had people that had lost loved ones. You, you had all sorts of things that had gone wrong. At one point in the trial, Jacqueline Troy's husband was testifying. She's the one who had her vocal cords cut during an operation at Legacy Surgery Center and was brought to the ICU by ambulance suffering from a severe infection. He was describing for the jury her state in the hospital and the pain that she was in, and they thought she was dying. I mean, she was dying there in the hospital from infections and the injuries that Dr. Dunch had caused her and he starts crying on the stand. And then we look over at the jury, and four of the jury members were also crying with him. We realized that they didn't know that she had lived, that she had survived, because of the way it was being presented. And so when she walked into the courtroom after her husband to testify, the jury was relieved. You could see it on their faces. <laughs> The defense team saw it, too. Here's Robbie McClung. Before you even get to Mary Eford, you can see that it's just, it's going downhill. And so did Dunch. And you can see it in him, because his shoulders are slumping more and more and more. To make a judgment, the jury had to learn about neurosurgery. And they had a good teacher, Dr. Martin Lazar. He walked the jurors through everything that was done wrong. They're fascinated by Dr. Lazar. 
who would step down from the stand and explain to them in very easy terms with these anatomical models exactly what was going on and the jury would lean in and they were catching everything that Dr. Henderson and Dr. Lazar were saying. Oh my God, he was excellent. It was devastating testimony. And it was during Dr. Lazar's testimony that Dunch's defense attorneys noticed a change come over their client. They told me they thought it was the first time he realized that he really was a horrible surgeon. It wasn't the mountains of evidence that they'd already heard. It was Lazar. I think that, that he thought he was doing pretty good, really and truly, in his own mind until he actually heard from those experts up there. On the sixth day of testimony, Shugart called the star witness for the prosecution. One of the most dramatic parts was when we called Dr. Dunge's ex-girlfriend, Kimberly Morgan, to testify. She's a major in the Air Force and at the time of the trial was deployed overseas. She testified via Skype. She told the jury how kind and caring Dunge could be with his patients, but that his demeanor could change and become more angry and confrontational. She had some difficulty talking about Jerry Summers and Kelly Martin. Have you tried not to think about these cases? The DA asks. Yes, ma'am. Morgan answers. Tried to put them out of your mind as much as you could? Yes, ma'am. They were traumatic. Finally, she was asked to read parts of the Occam's Razor email, the one Dunch had sent her where he called himself a cold-blooded killer. Dunch's attorney, Robbie McClung, remembers the impact across the courtroom. You know, that was like an ex-girlfriend really, you know, putting the knife in his back. And that just really, that really hurt, hurt Chris a lot. Because it was taking words out of context. It was, he believed he was doing some venting in an email to someone he thought was a friend. From the prosecution side, Sugar too, saw the effect on the jury. The reading of the email was very dramatic and the jury was wide-eyed. They could not believe who he was and the things that he was saying in this email. The defense called a single witness, a neurosurgeon from a highly regarded medical school in Dallas. He was not there to defend Dunch's surgical skill, but to help the jury understand, as the attorneys put it, the culture that surrounds the surgical community. In other words, he was put on the stand to make the case that Dunn shouldn't be held solely responsible. He said, I think in order for this to happen, it would require a complete system failure. On February 14th, 2017, following eight days of testimony, the jurors left to consider their verdict. As the jurors deliberated, the patients, witnesses, the lawyers, all were left to wonder, why did Christopher Dunch do what he did? His defense attorneys thought he didn't realize he was a bad surgeon until a fellow neurosurgeon testified to all his errors during the trial. His father claimed it was pride and his deep-seated impulse to keep working harder in the face of difficulty. Michelle Schugert chalks it up to greed, ego, substance abuse. All of these things were combining together where he just thought he was this huge, unstoppable force. He had a God complex. He thought he could do anything he wanted, be anyone, um, and he wasn't going to let anyone stand in his way or stop him. Nothing was his fault. Others, though, have described him as a madman with a scalpel, a sociopath, a psychopath. If it was immoral, did he know it was immoral? The sociopath, or secondary psychopath, is somebody who knows the difference. Jim Fallon is a neuroscientist at the University of California at Irvine who studied sociopaths and serial killers for decades. They know what they're doing is wrong, and that's different than a psychopath who really doesn't think what they're doing is, is quite wrong. A very essential difference. I went to Fallon for his opinion on Dunch, but before we started, he wanted to make one thing really clear. It's really with a huge caveat. Fallon has never met or examined Christopher Dunch, but he was willing to talk about Dunch's public behavior. So here's somebody who's really compromised, in a judgment's compromised to begin with, from the people who grew up with him. He was very narcissistic, but very focused. 
So he looks like he's got traits of narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder. He also has traits of psychopathy, but he also has uh, traits that are not consistent with that. But he's got a perfect storm of where he was from, lack of sophistication, heavy constant drug alcohol abuse, and then getting so far into something and not being able to pull back. And and being narcissistic enough saying, "I, I can't admit that I can't do this. Dr. Henderson and Dr. Kirby, two of the doctors who did the most to stop Dench, came to their own conclusions. Christopher Dench was a sociopath. He was not wired like the rest of us are wired together. He's a a criminal. But do you think he knew he was a bad surgeon? He thought he was doing his best. I don't think he thought he was a bad surgeon because he he would have stopped operating. He kept operating. After all these bad results in these patients, and I think he thinks he's a great surgeon still. Well, I probably would have always given him the benefit of the doubt that he was just poorly or inadequately trained uh, and that his ego was just way too big because of his intelligence. But in the end, Henderson would be swayed by one damning piece of evidence. And if I hadn't have seen the chain of emails that he created, uh, one where he he refers to himself as a cold-blooded killer. Well, I believe he was a cold-blooded killer. The jury thought so too. It took them only four hours to agree on a verdict, and later, an hour to decide on punishment. The doctor convicted of intentionally botching a woman's surgery will spend the rest of his life in prison. This is unprecedented. Christopher Dunch was convicted of injury to an elderly person and sentenced to life in prison. He's believed to be the first doctor in the country tried in court for the way he practiced medicine. At the courthouse, patients and their families felt a cathartic release of joy and sorrow. Kelly Martin's daughter cried outside the courtroom. I'm just so grateful from the bottom of my heart. This will not bring my mother back, but it is some sense of justice for all of the families, for all of the victims. And Michelle Shugart spoke at a press conference organized by the DA's office. I think the big thing for us was that the patients just kept going on and on. I mean, if it had just been the first couple of patients, like we said in court, you know, those are probably just malpractice cases. But the fact that he continued to go on hurting patients after patients, that's what really turned this into a criminal case. We did this for the victims because of what they've suffered and wanted everybody to know that this will not be tolerated. And another assistant DA, Stephanie Martin. What is most important about this case is that this is unprecedented. Uh, No one has ever prosecuted a doctor for surgeries gone wrong. And we did it in Dallas County because no one has ever done the things that Christopher Dunch did. The medical community system has a problem, but we were able to solve it in the criminal courthouse. Not everyone subscribes to the idea that the legal system should be the ones to decide where to draw the line between medical malpractice and assault. There's been some pushback in the medical community that that our behavior in the operating room is now can be criminalized and we can be thrown in jail for do, trying to save people's lives. That's Dr. Kirby. I just laugh at him. That there's never been anyone like Christopher Dunch ever. Last spring, I went to see Mary Eford. She now lives in a senior center north of town. Her difficulty walking and moving has taken her independence. We sat and talked and made plans for me to return a few days later for an interview. But the next day, I got an email from her that said, I have tried really hard for the past year to put the trial behind me. I'm still not where I would like to be health-wise, and I have had to accept this. Talking about this again would only cause more pain. It was necessary last February to do what was required to bring justice for all who were injured, but that is done now. Good luck in your endeavors. Before we get back to the story, I want to let you know that there have been some new developments in the case of Christopher Dunch. 
We'll be posting extra episodes to keep listeners updated on this and potentially other cases. To make sure you don't miss out on any update, please take a moment to subscribe to Dr. Death wherever you're listening right now. You'll find a link in the episode notes, or if you're using an iPhone, you can say, Siri, subscribe to the Dr. Death podcast. Thank you. Christopher Dunch was an outlier, but if you look at his actions as a sort of stress test on the system, then it failed miserably. After the trial, attorneys on both sides say they will never think about the healthcare system the same way again. During the trial, one of Dunch's own defense lawyers, Richard Franklin, was shocked to hear his own doctor's name come up as someone who had referred patients to Dr. Dunch. And what did you think when you heard that this was your own doctor? I was kind of a little uh, uh, weirded out because uh, you, I used to think that they only recommended people that they really knew and that they really felt were qualified to do the surgery and that there had been a lot of favorable results. But as we find out in this case, no, that's not the case at all. And she didn't know anything about him. That she was told, okay, this is our number one neurosurgeon. You need to send all your patients to this guy. And that's exactly what she did. And, but and we don't know that as patients. We do now. If she had recommended him, I would have gone to him. Michelle Shugart. The problems in the system that allowed this to happen with him are still there. Some of the hospitals have fixed some internal stuff. Um, Baylor Hospital, I know, has made a few changes, and Dallas Medical Center certainly has. Dallas Medical Center has a new administration. University General has closed entirely. I can't say what internal changes Baylor Plano's made since they refused to talk to me. The hospitals who got burned by it, they learned their lesson and they're far more cautious. I think overall the system still is built in such a way that any doctor could slip through. Why did Dr. Dunch keep going? It's a question I've been asking myself for months, and the truth is, I still can't answer it. He was certainly blinded to his mistakes by his own hubris, but it was more than that. I wanted to walk away thinking that the case of Christopher Dunch was such an anomaly that nothing like this could ever happen anywhere else again. That the safety net had been tightened. That the next dangerous surgeon wouldn't slip through the cracks in a system that's supposed to protect us. I didn't find the reassurance I was looking for. But it turns out there was there was really very little we could do within the medical community that I could ascertained to do other than make the complaints, repeatedly make the complaints, and have multiple physicians make the complaints, but only after subsequent injuries to additional patients had occurred, which which I, I think is uh, extraordinarily disturbing. Do you think anything has changed as a result of this case that would keep this from happening again? No. I've heard it said that when planes crash, it's not because one big thing went wrong. It's because a whole lot of small things went wrong at the same time. That's why planes don't crash very often at all. But sometimes, Sometimes they do. And still, we fly. We board the plane with little worry about getting home. We should feel at least that secure when we step into a hospital. Ultimately, there's no winners. While I didn't find reassurance, I did find one thing I wasn't expecting. Grace. Here's Barry Morgoloff. I mean, you have a guy that went to medical school, that trained, that there were sacrifices made by his family, and he's serving a life sentence. 
There are people that are dead. There are people that are injured. There are people, there's no winners in this deal. It's sad all the way around. I mean, I do have empathy for the doctor's family. I have empathy for him. Even though he ruined a substantial part of my life, my life is so different. I still have empathy for him. That seems like kind of a remarkable thing to say. People think I'm nuts. Uh, I think that I have to for my own soul. I need to forgive. I do not have the luxury of harboring resentments. So I have to let it go. There are 33 families in Dallas who live with what Christopher Dunge did and what others didn't do. But there were those people who didn't just stand by, the doctors and lawyers, the reporters and nurses, the hospital staff, and the patients themselves. All of them don't want what happened in Dallas to happen anywhere else ever again. Christopher Dunch is currently incarcerated in Huntsville, about an hour outside of Houston. In April, he turned 47. He's appealing the verdict, and his appellate attorney isn't approving interviews. If he wins the appeal, he'll get a new trial. But if that happens, Michelle Schugert said she's prepared to try him again and on the five other cases of aggravated assault, whatever it takes to keep him in prison for the rest of his life. <laughs> 